Okay. Um, so thank you so much, everyone, um, for coming. Uh, really um, pleased to see you all. Welcome to our panel, um, The Humanitarian Face in War, co-organized co by um, UFE's Global Development Studies Program in the School for Social Justice and Global Stewardship, UFE's Research Center for Justice, Equity, and Sustainable Action, and the BC Council for International Cooperation. We also appreciate the support given to this event by Global Affairs Canada. So my name is Gitanjali Gill, and I'm an assistant professor in global development studies um, at UFE, and also the current director at the Research Centre for Justice, Equity, and Sustainable Action. To mark Canada's International Development Week 2024, we have invited five humanitarian actors who are responding to global conflicts to share their thoughts and experiences. International Development Week has been marked in Canada since 1991 to recognize our country's contributions to development aid and humanitarian assistance. Those of us who are attending this event in person at the University of the Fraser Valley are situated on the lands of the Stolo people, people of the river, and for those of you joining from Zoom or from other parts of the from other parts of the world, I ask you to also pause and acknowledge the unceded Indigenous land upon which you are situated, as well as the Indigenous peoples who have been stewards of this land for millennia. And as we come together today to discuss global conflict um, and our responses to them. Um, many of these conflicts uh, we should recognize stem from colonization, oppression, and land dispossession. I invite all of us to reflect upon the historic and current injustices committed against Indigenous people across Turtle Island and beyond. And while we think about and celebrate the work of Canadians in addressing humanitarian needs around the world, I encourage us to reflect upon the work that still needs to be done to recognize and repair injustices facing Indigenous communities locally and globally. I would like to call up next um, Adetun Ilumoka, who is the lead on policy, uh, social movements and knowledge exchange and women, peace and security at the BC Council for International Cooperation to say a few words. Adetun. Let me work in front of the cameras. Okay. Thank you very much, Keaton Chari. Um, I'm delighted to be here this morning with you all. Um, there are three of us representing the BC Council for International Cooperation, and we are very pleased to be collaborating in this event. Um, the department, I believe it is a department of um, social justice and global stewardship, very unusual name. When I saw it, I thought this is a step in the right direction from development studies to something a lot broader that also indicates a certain um, attitude and disposition towards um, international relations, I think. So the BC Council for um, International Cooperation is a coalition of civil society groups, international development organizations, and individuals um, that works in solidarity and partnership with various groups all over the world. Um, we work on a variety of issues, and one of the um, most, the closest to our hearts these days is climate change, gender equality, and we hope that um, many of you here will follow some of what we do if you visit our website. Um, we do so with an attitude of, I, I would say, aid getting away from aid towards more of solidarity and partnerships. And so this is one of the things we aim to encourage people in BC to do more and more, to view these relationships through this lens. So our mandate is to facilitate knowledge exchange with various parts of the world, is to encourage residents of BC to take an interest in these issues, um, and to encourage also the building of bridges with people, um, with these development organizations, um, with governments, with universities, of course, as we're doing today, um, and also building bridges with Global Affairs Canada. Of course, we have a representative from Global Affairs Canada um, today. And so we look forward very much to this um, conversation on humanitarian, the humanitarian face in war. Um, a lot of people don't 
realize or recognize the importance, especially in academic conversations, of humanitarian um, aid. And though we knock aid sometimes, um, if you're in a conflict situation, you it's a lifesaver. And so, and the people who are involved in these endeavors are taking a lot of risks. And so I look forward today to hearing firsthand from many of the people who are involved in this kind of work. So I welcome you all. We look forward to these conversations and to having a really vibrant discussion. Thank you. Thank you so much, Atatune. Um, I would like to now um, invite uh, Math Matthew to say a few words um, for our opening. Thank you very much, Gitanjali, and uh, thank you, Atatune, for those words in, in opening this, this conversation. Uh, and I'd be remiss as well if I didn't uh, officially thank the BC Council for International Cooperation and the University of Fraser Valley <laughs> for for both hosting this event and for inviting me uh, and GAC to be a to be a part of it. International Development Week, of course, is a is an important moment to reflect on on all of the work that we collectively do to advance the SDGs. Uh, and we at Global Affairs, you know, recognize and value the partnerships that are critical to achieving that those, those objectives. You know. The partnerships, of course, with the countries and the communities in which we work, first and foremost, with UN agencies, with NGOs that are that we partner with in delivering services to those that are affected by conflict and, and otherwise, um, but also with academia that uh, really helps shape how we work. And I've had a lot of conversations over the last few months, particularly in refugee spaces with with academics that have that have informed how we engage in humanitarian spaces. So we really do value that that piece. And, and of course, with Canadians uh, that ultimately we represent and that are remain incredibly engaged on, on these issues. I think the conversation today around the humanitarian face of war, uh, it could not be more relevant. And you know, we all we all follow the headlines and we followed them for a while. So so we know how important it is. Uh, and it could not feel more timely. Uh, for for those who are caught in in conflict between warring parties, who are worried about surviving, who are worried about you know their their loved ones, about shelter for the night, about food for the for their next meal, uh, the SDGs you know achieving those those longer term development goals appears really far and distant, uh, and so I think it's incumbent upon us as as Canadians as the international community to really come together and. and and provide that much needed humanitarian assistance, which at the core is really about saving lives and, and alleviating that immediate suffering. Um, and as Canada, I think we have a longstanding tradition of humanitarian assistance. Uh, we're, we're a leader in supporting a rules-based international order and, and one that aims to uphold international humanitarian law as the fundamental rules of war. Because I think we all recognize that, you know, there is war, there, there will likely continue to be war. But even in that conflict, there there is a need for us to be for, for there to be humanity. And there are there is a way for which in which war can be conducted in a way that helps shelter and, and pr protect civilians. Uh, but Canada is also a leader in responding to the needs of those that have been affected by conflict and natural disasters. And, and we know that those needs are growing in this year, in 2024. The U.N. is appealing uh, for I, I had the number of. Uh, I think it's over $50 billion, uh, and this identified over 300 million people in need of humanitarian assistance. Most of those people are in, in uh, countries that have been affected by protracted conflicts, the DRC, Lebanon, Somalia. These are not new crises, and the people have been living in, um, in precarious situations for a long time. But we've also seen a greater number of new or, or rapidly deteriorating emergencies Sudan this year, of course, Gaza, um, and we've seen a greater convergence of challenges. So conflict conflict is hard enough, but conflict compounded with climate change, with natural disasters, when you think of the earthquake that happened in Turkey and Syria earlier this year, uh, you know, those, those populations in northern Syria were already facing humanitarian crises and, and had to face a compounding, uh, com compounding issues. So in that context, as Canada, we, do, we are responding. We've provided nearly a billion dollars in humanitarian assistance in 2023 in across 67 countries. 
And we're working, and I said it earlier, partnerships are critical. We're working through an international humanitarian system made up of UN, Red Cross, and NGO partners, NGOs both local and international, including Canadian NGOs. And that system has been critical in ensuring that we can reach the most people, uh, the most people in need, that our response is coordinated, and that we can deliver at scale uh, quickly. And that system is made up of partners that we all trust to deliver according to humanitarian principles. So those principles of humanity, of impartiality, of neutrality and independence uh, are as important as ever. And we're seeing it day in and day out in contexts like Sudan and, 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 uh, and Gaza, where they're under strain. The whole system is under strain. Uh, the needs are far outpacing the resources that are available to address them. That's uh, the humanitarian needs have tripled since 2014. Um, and there is no, they don't look to be easing on the horizon. Forcibly displaced people alone have reached record highs, 114 million forcibly displaced people around the world today, 30 years, 30 some odd million of them refugees, people who've been, who've been forced across, across a border. And the space available to, to, uh, to help those people is shrinking. Humanitarians already faced an incredibly dangerous job uh but the security threats they're facing have been have have increased dramatically of course in gaza we're all you know we've seen the numbers the, the they've been devastated they've been devastating for for un workers but also in conflicts like sudan and elsewhere humanitarians are increasingly under threat uh security so security is is hard but also Threats to, access, to humanitarian access aren't just about security. They're also about bureaucracy and issues like visas and other, and other bureaucratic hurdles that prevent humanitarians from delivering effectively. And they're about politicization. I think, you know, we've all valued humanitarian aid and the, the independence that humanitarians need to have in order to deliver effectively, to have access to populations. But that but that independence is under threat. The politicization of humanitarian aid is something that we're witnessing in conflicts, contexts around Ukraine, Gaza, and elsewhere, and it's increasing and it it's curtailing the space of our partners to work. So we need to change how we work. Uh, I think that we, we continue to have a lot of faith in the system and the system that many of the organizations on the panel today represent. Um, you know, but we do recognize that it, it's got to change. Like some things have to change. It cannot alone cannot address the needs. So I think you know we're taking steps like in helping OJA better coordinate. Uh, we are committed to the issues of localization, and I'm really happy to see William from Pada on the panel today because I think local organizations play a critical role in responding to needs. They're best placed. They're closer to the communities. They have a better access, and they know what is needed. Um, and and I think we're taking steps as Canada to make that easier um, and to, to channel more funding and more supports to local organizations as directly as possible. And then we have to work across uh, across the nexus, um, the nexus of humanitarian and development, because humanitarian is a band-aid, but it needs to be accompanied by longer term development investments and partnerships that will address the root causes of conflict and really ultimately build the resilience of communities. And finally, I think we have a, a shared commitment to um, uh, reinforcing international humanitarian law and creating the space for humanitarian action. It's been 75 years since Gen the Geneva Conventions were signed. Um, they are as relevant today as they were back then. 25 years ago, Canada put protection of civilians on the agenda of the United Nations Security Council. Um, and it is as important today as it was then. Uh, last year, we signed the, the we joined the many, I think it was 80 or so states and joined the political declaration against the explosive weapons in, in populated areas. Um, and I think, you know, that is as relevant today as it was then. So we have to reinforce IHL and we have to be consistent about it and, and continue. So I think the conversation today is very welcome. I'm very much looking forward to, to what the panelists have to say. I think we in Global Affairs Canada recognize that our role in humanitarian assistance is a little bit removed. We aren't, we aren't implementers. We aren't on the ground as much as our partners 
in NGOs in the UN and in the system that are that are there every day responding to to the needs of people. So I'm very interested and very uh, curious and, and looking forward to the conversation. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much, um, Matthew, for addressing some of these um, very pressing humanitarian conflicts, some of which we're going to be speaking about today, and also speaking about Canada's commitments, um, as Matthew is the Director for Humanitarian Policy at Global Affairs Canada. Um, I'd like to now um, transition over to um, our hearing from our speakers, um, and I'd like to call up uh, Dr. Sherry Enns, um, who is an associate professor and program chair of the UFE planning program, but also a professor in uh, both pl in planning, geography, and global development studies, to introduce our first uh, two speakers. All right, thank you. So maybe, oh, if we could bring up William, um, that would be perfect. It's an honor to be here and to introduce our first guest who I count as a colleague and as a friend. He has traveled some distance to be in Juba where he hopes to have secure Wi-Fi, but we all understand the challenges that could be involved with that. So my practice is more in the space between um, looking at climate change and the impacts on people who are displaced and need to relocate. And really what I want to showcase today is a colleague who works as the, a diaspora in a community that's facing considerable challenges and really at the heart of what has already been referred to, the triple nexus with respect to humanitarian and development within an overarching peace building framework. William Kalong is the leader and managing director of Pan A Will Agency, and he'll share a little bit about his story as a lost boy of Sudan, moving um, from Ethiopia to Kakuma, a refugee camp in Northern Kenya, to eventually as a refugee in Canada. I first connected with him in in his Canadian role, but more recently through work I've been doing with South Sudan, he's been a mentor and an advisor, but not just to me, to many students at UFE who are currently working on a project in Nairobi with South Sudanese urban youth refugees. William is really at the foundation of his vision is his story for a very integrated response to development. And I don't wanna take away any more of his time, except to say, Welcome, Ken welcome, William. Thank you for being here and somehow in 15 minutes to share your story, the role that you have, and as well the recent pressures facing your region due to the conflict in Sudan that have been only compounded through climate events. Thank you. Thank, uh, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Cherry, for the uh, wonderful introduction. So I hope everybody can see me. Uh, it is um, is around nine, almost nine thirty in in Juba time uh, at night. So um, uh, first of all, I want to say I miss Canada. It's good to see everyone. I was told it's snowing there, so which is good. I'm not a fan of snow, but thank you for inviting me. Um, first of all, as uh, Sherry mentioned earlier, uh, my my life story need at least thirty minutes to forty minutes to go through it but I'll try to scan around it. Um, and I, I was happy also with Matthew of how he was talking about the Sudan uh, crisis and which caused what happened to us. Um, it began so long ago, uh, back in 1983, when the first war between the Sudan and the South Sudan happened, where all of us, the children, especially the boys, uh, known as the Lost Boy today, uh, I traveled from my village to Ethiopia four months Probably I was about eight years old, and I spent most of my life in uh, Panyudo refugees camp in Ethiopia. In 1991, we were also, Ethiopian were also captured, so we were thrown away. We were told to leave, so we left also another three months to Kenya. And uh, yes, that was the beginning of our life changing in Kenya. I stayed in Kenya refugees camp, and I was lucky in 1998 to go to Canada, uh, where I can, uh, where I rebuild my life again. From all those years since I left in 1984, I have not heard from my family. And when the peace of Sudan, between the Sudan and the South Sudan was signed, 
the first mission for me from Canada to come is to find my parents. And uh, apparently from my parents, they, they, they thought that I was dead because by the time I left, there was no communication. So I was lucky I have some friends at, with the UNHCR who managed to get them. I came back, I took my three weeks leave from Canada as usual, and I met my family for the first time. So when I met my family, uh, the, my father believed that I was dead. And when I revealed that your son is still alive, there was a lot of joy. Because when I met them, what my father said first as a chief is thing that they need as they, they just came back from refugee camp. Because all, the, all of them were just returning from Sudan after the signature of the peace agreement in 2005. He was talking of the need of water. He was talking to me the need from his community of, for food. He was talking of need of clinics and all those. As I, I stayed with him for three weeks, I returned to Canada in Vancouver. Three weeks exactly, my father passed away. And that was the beginning of what we call pan Will Development Agencies. So I started that organization. I started coming back and forth uh, to, uh, to our wheel and to <clears throat> part of South Sudan. We start first with water, and then we build clinics, and we build some under-tree schools, because I believe education is the key. And um, I didn't want a war again to happen to, to our people. So I also start doing what we call people-to-people -people grassroots peace conference between, between the Arab nomads and the, and the South Sudanese uh, host community. Because we have seen that, that was a problem because the Arab nomads were used by, by the Khartoum government to destroy the property of the Dinkas in South Sudan. And that was the war that displaced me in the first place. We managed to do that. I started doing that in 2008. Where we do annual peace conferences uh, every year. We have pre-migration and peace uh, and then post-migration as well every year. And we set some law. This we I call it people to people grassroots peace conference. No politics involved, and it has been working so well. It is now um, uh, we are doing a lot of training now. The other communal who have cut a reading and who are fighting among themselves. It is too unfortunate that uh, last year, uh, you know, the village where I came from is bordering Darfur. It is close to eastern Darfur, where the current conflict is started. Our, the school that we built for the children are not being are now being used as accommodation for the uh, for the refugees from Sudan, especially from Darfur. And uh, the, the 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 money that the partners have, most of the partners say they have shortage of money. We are not doing anything uh, so far. Uh, there is no funding. Uh, the little resources that we had at that time, we had used it all. The clinic that we built is no longer enough. And, and people are still pleading their, their, their place every now and then uh, to, uh, to Northern Bar Hazal State, where we have about three uh, camps. We are directly involved to that one. So I'm thankful that there is a person from Global Affairs, because I heard uh, from some of the partners that they were funding, and uh, that there is a need of, of that, of uh, supporting the refugees in Northern Bar Hazal State. Uh, some of our activities, uh, as uh, they are somewhere in our website, and I'll share it later on, on the email because the network I'm I'm using is not uh, that uh, great uh, to do the pictures sharing and all this. But I'll share uh, later on by email. Uh, we had a lot of um, uh, we have a lot of uh, women uh, livelihood projects that we 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 we, we invented a couple of years ago. Uh, we have dialogue the peace uh, peace committees which we we train to make sure they move from camp to camp to uh, to, to to do uh, early warning and early response awareness. Uh, we have established some uh, some committees that are doing the GBV uh, within the, the the refugees camp that uh, we are we are working on. So there's quite few things that uh, we are doing in uh, in northern Barkhadal as well as in Rang area. Uh, particularly for South Sudan uh, context. Um, well, for 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 most of you and uh, Sherry has come, uh, we we still have also a lot of youth challenges. Education is another problem in South Sudan. Uh, the country has no curriculums, and you probably know. After we gain our independence, the people of South Sudan went back to war in 2013, and that was a war of positions. 
Currently, they are talking of a uh, of permanent uh, ceasefire with other holdout groups, which are supposed to be coming in. Uh, you all know South Sudan have about five vice president just to accommodate everyone. Uh, I was involved in negotiating such uh, because we realized uh, the war that they have is a war of position. Uh, you need a seat. You need to say so. We create more position for them in order for them to uh, to to you know not to cause problem. Um, currently, the implementation of that agreement uh, is is holding on well. Uh, we hope. And uh, the government is still pushing to how to hold the elections in 20, 20, 2024. Uh, hopefully, they will do that, and hopefully, we'll have the uh, I mean the the permanent uh, peace that the people of South Sudan are building. But again, the war in Sudan is really really affecting uh, the neighboring communities of South Sudan, and that even make our work a lot easier. Uh, properties are occupied by children and women, but we cannot tell them to leave because they need a shelter to stay in. And that is the, 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 the fact and that's one of the main challenges that facing uh, the people of South Sudan currently and the people of Sudan. Uh, the South Sudanese are also worried that maybe the war for Sudan will spill to South Sudan, especially the, the bordering community. So still the people are still moving from their villages and they are going to uh, to town avoiding uh, the war again uh, that it may affect them if it happened so i want to thank everybody uh, thank you so much for bringing me on board and i was so delighted to listen to some of the key uh, speakers that have spoken before me as well as uh, those who will speak is a good forum uh, for me to learn a lot and uh, it's a good forum that will be sharing most of it so I want to thank you very much. I don't want to take a lot of time from people, but I want to thank uh, Sherry and University of Fraser Valley for inviting me. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, William, so, so much. And I know some of you will be working with him even in May and June when you go um, to Kenya through the Global Skills Opportunities. So our next guest is also an honor to introduce, Asiya Ahmed. I think I met you 10 years ago or so in your role in International Development Project here at University of the Fraser Valley. Since that time, we've not been able to connect as much in person. I've watched your career virtually and have recently been wanting to reach out because of some of the projects I have within the region where you're an expert. You are a protection expert interested in the intersection of power, politics, justice, and humanitarian aid. Asiya has over 14 years experience working globally with NGOs, the International Committee of the Red Cross and UN to protect the rights of civilians during and post-conflict. Um, especially between the years 2016 and 2022. Asiya Ahmed led the human rights program for UN Relief and Works Agency for Palestine Refugees in the Near East, UNRWA, and has also had experience with Syria, Jordan, and Jerusalem, and more recently, Gaza. Since leaving the UN, Asiya has continued to engage in public advocacy on international law and refugee rights. She holds a bachelor in and master's of arts and political science, or political science from SFU. And it's with um, great honor that we hope to learn um, from you now and welcome you to UFE and happy to see you in person again. Welcome. Oh, good morning. Um, thank you very much to Dr. Enns and Dr. Gill for the invitation to speak. It's really wonderful to be back here after so many years to join you in discussing this most timely topic. Um, today I want to discuss a topic that is absolutely key to humanitarian work during war, advocacy, speaking up, speaking out for civilians caught in conflict, what Doctors Without Borders calls the duty and privilege of bearing witness to draw attention, mobilize action, and stand in solidarity with those affected. So thinking about the fact that what we say to the world about those affected, about the faces of war, um, is many times as important and sometimes more impactful than what we actually do to support those affected on the ground. 
I'd like to begin by painting a scene that I hope will give life to the subject matter at hand. The example I'm offering was documented by a number of media outlets, including a December 7, 2023 Washington Post article. That's two months into the current crisis in Gaza. The Post article details a confrontation during a November 30th video call between um, WFP World Food Program employees and their director, Cindy McCain, the current director. In the call, staff criticized her very heavily for not individually, so not only jointly with other organizations, but individually uh, calling for a ceasefire. So keeping in mind, this is two months ago. They asked her why, as Gazans face starvation during, due to the siege on Gaza, WFP, which is taxed, tasked evidently with delivering food assistance in emergencies, that she would not say that food is being used as a weapon of war, as WFP has done in many other places, including Ethiopia and Yemen. At the time of publication, the Israeli government stated that no electricity, no food, no fuel would be allowed to enter the densely populated enclave. At the same time, in December of last year, organizations such as Human Rights Watch were stating publicly that starvation was being used as a weapon of war. Other UN organizations, including the World Health Organization, had loudly and individually called for a ceasefire. So the question we're gonna be addressing today in micro and macro, is it clear that Cindy McCain, the director, should have called individually for a ceasefire? Could she have? Why didn't she, and what were the constraints, if any? I'd like to take us from an audience reading about these statements in, in newspapers to the backroom discussions that I've been a part of, countless times where the debates happen and the decisions are made. Who or what determines which population's needs are spoken about loudly and others with more trepidation? It's both impossible and not my goal in a 12 minute presentation to demonstrate causation with regard to such a complex to topic, especially but not limited to the fact that only WFP officials know the motivation behind their statements. My goal instead is to use a current and important example to highlight the potential for correlation or relationships that demonstrate that what organizations say or what they do does not operate in a vacuum, much like our colleague, Mr. Kimmel, was speaking about from Global Affairs Canada. The politicization of aid, the role of donors, and that how and what organizations do is affected by a multitude of obvious and perhaps not so obvious considerations, which I'll outline using a mini case study. So just to be here about, um, clear about what we're talking about, a couple of definitions. We're speaking today about public protection advocacy. So public statements, press releases, interviews, donor briefings, um, documentaries, photos, published academic work that supports, elevates, or highlights human rights issues around the protection of civilians amidst conflict. We're not talking about private protection advocacy, what happens behind closed doors, classified documents, anything we don't see in the public sphere. So I like to, um, when, when I was working on public advocacy with colleagues, whether specifically but not limit, limited to um, with UNRWA, um, I would think about categorizing, the, categorizing these considerations into two groups, the kind of the evident considerations and perhaps the less evident. The first are what my colleague was, uh, Mr. Kimmel was mentioning about the principles of humanitarian advocacy, which must never be uh, broken and must be upheld um, by any organization worth its salt. So humanity, the focus of human beings and their needs at the core of the action, impartiality, uh, the ensuring, ensuring that um, there is no distinction between who receives aid and it's based on need, not other uh, considerations. Neutrality, remain, remaining, um, not, not taking sides, and independence, which he outlined. Secondly, and I mean, as importantly, this is not necessarily in order, is the do no harm principle. So will the action in question um, harm in any shape or way the, the uh, affected population and or other populations, whether it's host population or, or anyone else? And if the answer is, yes, then evidently do not do not go forward. So safety, access to the population, security, so on and so forth. Then again, as was mentioned, very important staff safety and security, which is uh, becoming more and more of a concern. 
And finally, the impact. Will this statement actually affect change or be part of a long-term meaningful call for change that, that, that makes a difference? Less evident or discussed, but many times the most significant in determining what an agency or organization does, but in this case, let's focus on not so much the doing, but the speaking out, are issues of um, donor pressure and political considerations and pressure. So are donors, specifically primary donors, also government donors? And if so, will those governments exert influence on the messaging of the organization at key moments. So as a mini case study, let's return to the example given in my opening remarks, where the director general of the World Food Program came under fire from her own employees for not calling for this ceasefire. So for just for some context and to situate that moment today, two months after that article was published, we know through media outlets from the New York Times to CNN that many Gazans are now using grass and animal feed in place of flour, and Gazans now make up 80% of all people facing famine or catastrophic hunger worldwide. That statistic comes from the United Nations Office of the High Commission for Human Rights in January of 2024. I would also note, um, having been part of, I, I mean, I would say over 150 different public statements um, in a span of eight years with UNRWA that calling for a cessation of violence, i.e. putting down arms, is typically one of the least controversial statements an organization can make. And this is contrasted with outright condemnation of a party or parties to the conflict, i.e. saying that X country you know, committed an, um, uh, a crime against humanity um, or broke international humanitarian law. We're not talking about that. We're simply talking about asking parties to the conflict to put down uh, their arms. So going through the checklist that I outlined earlier to see which factors may have affected WFP's decision to re remain silent, the results may or may not surprise you. So first, yes, the affected population would very likely remain safe as a result of putting out a statement that a ceasefire should happen. Indeed, it would, the object would be to heighten their safety. Yes, WFP staff, staff would very likely remain safe and out of danger as a result. Yes, access would remain unimpeded. There's no evidence that access to the affected population would become impeded as a result. And yes, um, as we've seen, there would be and was a great potential of impact. Certainly not uh, what I'm trying to suggest is that if Cindy McCain had at, called for a ceasefire, there would have been a ceasefire, not at all. But in concert with multiple other United Nations organization heads, civil society, uh, government states, so on and so forth, uh, we would see that there may be international pressure um, to uh, for, a, for a ceasefire. So, so far, so good. Green light to proceed. Why wouldn't she do it if these were the only considerations? And I think this is where it gets really, really interesting. Is the organization coming to the question of donor and political pressure? Is WFP, the World Food Program, free from significant donor and political pressure? If no, can the organization still be said to adhere to principles of neutrality, impartiality, and independence? Can humanity remain at the core of advocacy? Based on the following information, I shall leave you to decide. Possible donor pressure. So on the issue of possible donor pressure, as of January 15th, 2024, WFP's yearly donor contributions of 8,467,892,969 dollars was led by the United States, who contributed 36% or 3,052,000,000 3 in change. Big donor. On the topic of potential political pressures, by that main donor. At the same time, the United States government offers roughly $3 billion in primarily military aid to Israel each year and is set to vote on a further additional $17.6 billion military funding package in relation to this conflict next week. So it offers roughly the same donor package in aid to the World Food Program as it does in military funding to one of the two parties to the conflict. 
Muddying the waters a little bit further is the approximately 450 to $600 million the United States offers in humanitarian and development assistance to the Palestinian Authority and UNRWA. That's changed a little bit in the last couple of weeks, but um, not a topic for today. The main donor, the United States, also systematically vetoes, has vetoed UN resolutions calling for a ceasefire. Finally, World, the World Food, Food Program's current director, Cindy McCain, is American. This is very important and is appointed by a highly, the highly political office of the UN Secretary General. She is also the widow of former Senator and 2008 Republican presidential nominee, John McCain. 2008 is a long time ago for some of us. So to put it in today's uh, context, imagine Melania Trump or Michelle Obama, for that matter, leading the World Food Program, the most powerful food program, the most powerful food aid organization in the world. As a result on, of these considerations and based absolutely on my experience, I would argue that there would have been and continues to be a very high level of pressure on the World Food, food Program by the United States, explicitly or implicitly. While working with the UN, I can tell you that I have had donor country officials call me up directly to discuss word choice in public statements, both before and after the statements were released, from language to messaging, when far, far, far less money was involved. And this was particularly in the occupied Palestinian territories, when, where in my uh, experience of working in 14 different countries, um, foreign interest was by far the greatest. So words do matter. As a footnote, um, I'll leave that part. To conclude, public advocacy that organizations use or choose to employ can only be as robust and timely as permitted by the humanitarian system and geopolitical world that they and they, their officials inhabit. If we acknowledge, not necessarily accept, but certainly acknowledge, as I do, that states act in their own best interests. And state-sponsored humanitarian aid, especially where that state has key interests, is rarely altruistic. Then we cannot be surprised that UN agencies are led by political appointees who make key decisions, at least in part based on current balances of power and or size of donor package. We mustn't be shocked. Again, it doesn't mean that we shouldn't challenge or that we should accept when those appointees are then stymied by donor governments and state pressure when put in a position to speak out about the best interests of affected populations. Realist politics and human rights paradigms will and do collide, I believe, very often. But I don't think all is lost. I think we should recall that the role of aid organizations, of humanitarian aid organizations, is not to be the sole or even the primary microphone for advocacy for civilians affected by war. Journalists, academics, elected officials, politicians, civil servants must also play their part. Most importantly, we, civil society, you and I, everybody in this room has the opportunity to speak up loudly and play a greater role in determining who we want to see in power, which by proxy may better ensure that we bear witness and advocate for all, not just some. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Asiya. Uh, I think we might have to just move the camera this way back to a bit more. We can get all of the screen a little bit more. Yeah. Is that, is that where it was before? <laughs> okay. All right. I have the pleasure of introducing um, our next two speakers. Um, I'd like to introduce Ginwa Monzer and Mohamed Lawa, who are from Right to Play's Lebanon office. Um, I recently worked with both of them and other um, staff from their office on a research project where we were trying to um, use some innovative uh, play-based methods of trying to understand the experiences and perspectives of girls and boys who have been displaced um, and that are living in Lebanon. Uh, Ginwa and Mohammed will speak about the context of Lebanon, the work that Right to Play does in the country to respond to the psychosocial needs of children uh, who are being affected by conflict and violence. 
Uh, so we can transition over to get Ginwan Mohammed. Thank you so much, Dr. Gitanjali, and hello, everyone. Um, I'm Renwa Munzer. I'm the Monitoring, Evaluation, and Learning Officer for Right to Play International in Lebanon. Uh, my colleague, uh, Mohamed, will also now introduce himself. Or... Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Mohamed Lawa. I'm uh, the Med Assistant in the Lebanon's Country Office for Right to Play. So first, I'd like to uh, thank Dr. Gitanjali for inviting us um, to present at this event. I think it's really important to um, to uh, raise the voice on such a topic. Uh, thanks for the speakers who just spoke also, and I think they um, already mentioned a lot of things that we can relate to uh, uh, in Lebanon. So, sorry, let me go to the beginning. Um, Today, we're going to um, present the situation in Lebanon and talk about the current context. We're going to also discuss a bit more about the, um, what Right to Play in specific is doing during these times. So first, we're going to start with um, a brief background on Right to Play International, Right to Play in Lebanon. Then we will go to the country context in Lebanon. And then um, Mohammed will take us to uh, what is Right to Play in Lebanon currently doing to respond to the current context. So briefly, Right to Play International uh, has a mission to protect, educate, and empower children to rise above adversity using the power of play. We work three, through four outcome areas, um, quality education, child protection, girls empowerment, health and well-being. And currently we, um, we work in 16 different countries. One of them is, uh, is Lebanon. Um, quickly about right to play in Lebanon or Lebanon first. So Lebanon is um, located on the uh, Eastern uh, side of the uh, Mediterranean Sea. And an area that has um, seen instability um, ages now um, because of its location, because of the countries um, around. Um, so um, Right to Play in Lebanon in specific uh, has started since 2006 across the country. We now reach around 28,000 children and youth yearly. We uh, implement activities throughout all the country uh, we serve children and youth and vulnerable communities from different nationalities, uh, starting with Palestinian and Syrian refugees, uh, Lebanese um, in uh, vulnerable areas, and we work with stateless children also. Now we will move to the country context after this, just brief about um, right to play. So um, Lebanon has been facing multiple crises throughout uh, um, uh, uh, the whole past years, um, we can say that starting 2019 till now, the situation has been worsening much, much more. Um, first, we will start with the refugee crisis. So um, since 1984, since the Israeli invasion to the Palestinian lands, um, uh, since then, Palestinian refugees have been coming to seek refugee in Lebanon. Um, this has yielded an um, uh, and around 470,000 Palestinians that are registered in Lebanon, 45% of which live in refugee camps and temporary shelters that you can see in the first picture to the left. So this is the situation of Palestinian refugee camps in Lebanon. Um, and since 2011, Syrian refugees also have fled to Lebanon, um, running from the Syrian war. An estimate of 1.5 million uh, are currently in Lebanon. Uh, most of which live in camps and informal in settlements. So um, after the refugee um, crisis, Lebanon also has been um, dealing with an econo economic breakdown. Um, since 2019, that uh, deterioration has been taking place and it has just been increasing since then. Currently, the inflation rates have reached 120%. Um, I guess Dr. Gitanjali have seen this presentation before, but the numbers are always changing. So back in 2019, we used to fill a car and uh, fuel, we used to pay 80,000 Lebanese pounds. In 2023 and still till 2024, we have to pay around 5 million Lebanese pounds. 
So that's around 60 time, 62 times more. Uh, that's the level of the inflation that we have um, currently in the, con uh, in the country. Um, since 2019 also, we had increased social and political tensions um, due to um, the revolution against the political, um, the political parties in place and against the ruling uh, system. Uh, or the, the regime. Um, so since then, there, there has been increased social and political tensions internally between the Benin's um, uh, um, nationals and between um, uh, also locals and um, um, refugees. In 2020, we had the Beirut blast, which, um, which uh, uh, destroyed which had uh, destroyed estimately 50,000 apartments, killed over 200 people and injured around 7,000. Um, during that same time, we had COVID-19 and the lockdown that also had uh, big impacts on all the sectors, starting with education, um, healthcare system, infrastructure, and uh, different sectors. And finally, we are dealing with war, mainly in the South area. Um, so here we're now, at least in this period of time, we're not talking about the um, previous uh, civil war in Lebanon. We're talking about the war that is uh, between um, between Lebanon and Israel and the occupied Palestinian lands uh, uh, from the southern side of Lebanon. So this conflict uh, has been uh, uh, there for ages. Um, basically since before 1984. Um, however, um, and the whole region has been unstable because, because of this. Um, however, it has um, drastically increased since October 2023. Uh, and here, uh, like, uh, it's a bit hard to talk about maybe the effect of um, Israeli attacks on south of Lebanon uh, in comparison to what is happening in Gaza. Uh, like the massacre that is taking place, there is beyond what a person can actually describe or talk about. However, just to talk briefly about um, the ongoing war that is taking place in the South and the effects um, on Lebanon, we have destruction of many border villages, uh, forced relocation of inhabitants to safer areas, disruption of education services, strain on the healthcare system, um, impact on other sectors, of course, like agriculture on, in those places, infrastructure and economy, and the ongoing uncertainty and instability in Lebanon in general um, and the region. So um, this is what is currently um, taking place in south of Lebanon. However, it's affecting the whole country by default. So um, after describing quickly the context in Lebanon, now we will move to uh, my colleague, Hamad. He is going to um, talk more about right to place interventions. However, here I'd like to mention one more thing that we're gonna present like the right to play interventions that have been taking place recently, knowing that many of the funds for such uh, for those projects have been already have already ended and not um, and not uh, uh, and not been uh, continued um, due to uh, also uh, um, donor uh, issues and you know where the donors need to uh, uh, focus on and and the uh, um, the sectors that they are focusing on. So these are the main um, uh, response that Right to Play has done, uh, but unfortunately not all of the projects are now still taking place. So to you, Mohammed. Thank you so much, Renoir. Uh, and thank you, everyone. Uh, I wanna first thank the panelists who talked. Uh, I think they gave a really good, uh, 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 like heartwarming, uh, uh, words about what's happening so it is good to hear people are uh, talking like this about the situation so jumping to uh, our uh, project in Lebanon currently so now we will present to you uh, a few of our projects so uh, we work mainly in, uh, on enhancing the edu education life skills career uh, and vocational skills social cohesion and gender and uh, yeah, and in response for the above mentioned uh, context we have, we added in all our projects the, the component of psychosocial support. Um, so first project uh, is the EQIE project. EQIE project is uh, a project that works mainly on education. So uh, it works on training teachers on the play-based learning, uh, so uh, to, as teaching approaches, developing interactive play-based digital, digital curriculum, 
to have more access to it for everyone. And we added the psychosocial component through developing awareness toolkits, videos, trainings uh, for teachers uh, and children and parents. Uh, our next project is uh, the music project. And uh, the music project went through four phases since 2019 until now. Uh, the project aims on supporting adolescents and youth to become agents of change in their community by enhancing their life skills through music approaches. The project includes now components like robotics, tech, and advocacy with clear focus on psychosocial support and well-being through music as an approach. Uh, next project will be uh, the sports project, which is, which was kids athletic, and uh, the sports project was uh, another approach we worked through to enhance children's life skills and psychosocial support, the social psychosocial well-being. This project. This project through uh, through different phases uh, and forms remain to remains to bring one of the best approaches to promote uh, peaceful communities. Uh, as children from different backgrounds come together to play sports and participate in tournament and play days, uh, yeah. So the project has been going from 2019 until uh, 2023. Now it's uh, we had the, the, the uh, December was the last uh, month of our project. Um, then we have uh, Fikra and Step project, which were, which were funded by UNICEF. And uh, there's, uh, now we're in, uh, in the Step project this year. Uh, we work on adolescents and youth mainly to enhance their career building uh, and vocational skills. So also through uh, play-based play, play approaches, we aim to increase the access to youth to skills and help them, uh, and help them to get employment. Uh, finally, uh, we have now the WeAm project, which was funded by the EU. Uh, it's a project to, uh, which is supposed to go until 2026. So the, 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 uh, the project is a consortium with the other organizations and focus on organizations and focuses on promote and supporting social stability and cohesion in the country. Uh, in the midst of the instability taking place, so through it, uh, through it, we aim to empower groups of youth and women through play-based approaches to begin to become agents of change in their communities and advocate for social cohesion through local community-based interventions and initiatives. Um, so these were the projects we are working on. Uh, now we have finally GWI, which is uh, the project that ended also last year. Uh, the project was uh, Mainly, de mainly developed to uh, create new uh, data collection approaches, more uh, fun, more uh, 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 child-friendly and participatory. So uh, now we are uh, in the process, uh, throughout, from this project, now we are in the process of creating tools and using these tools in our data collections from uh, starting this year. Thank you, Mohammed. Um, I'd like to add one one last note: is that again um, we work um, during these hard times um, um, and right to play scope of work. So we have to um, keep our identity. We have to keep what right to play initially does to work on education, on like social support, on child um, protection. These are the areas that we mainly focus on. However, the implementation definitely was affected. Uh, it's definitely now um, much harder some areas in the south and specific to work with Palestinian um, communities and inside Palestinian refugee camps because there's a high risk of um, implementing there. We are highly relying on um, implementing local partners. This is the approach mainly that Right to Play now is working on. So instead of working um, directly through our staff, we are relying on um, training uh, local partners and um, uh, 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 on local partners who can implement directly in the camps without having to move in and out, um, so to lessen the risk of uh, our interventions. Um, it is um, quite challenging to uh, address the, challenge, the, the uh, challenges that are um, now, uh, because of the war uh, eventually taking place, it's really challenging to focus on education while um, the, the children, the community as a whole is, um, is at risk of, um, facing war, so uh, for example. 
So um, we are trying as much as possible to get the needs of the community to try to um, discuss with donors and shift some of our activities to address more the current situation, like adding psychosocial support projects, uh, um, components in the projects um, to be able as much as possible to um, respond to the needs of the communities. Uh, so this is our um, brief presentation and we're happy to answer all your questions. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Ginwa and Mohammed, for um, uh, really putting a spotlight on the need to uh, address uh, the situation of, of children and vulnerable groups um, in, in times of conflict. Um, I'd like to now invite um, uh, Dr. Lauren Oates um, to come up um, to speak to us. Dr. Lauren Oates is the Executive Director of Canadian Women for Women in Afghanistan. Um, and I'm sure she'll be um, telling us more about the uh, very tireless work that she and others in her organization have been doing to advocate for, for the human rights of women and girls in Afghanistan, as well as the transformative power of education. Uh, Lauren's worked with UNICEF, USAID, WUSC, and others, um, and she's carried out um, doctoral research in northern Uganda on local language education with Ugandan teachers. Um, and I also wanted to just put in there that the BC branch uh, for Canadian Women for Women in Afghanistan were also recently honoured uh, with the Renata Shear Award um, from the United Nations Association of Canada's uh, BC Lower Mainland Branch. Uh, welcome, Lauren. Uh, sure, yeah, yeah. All right, hi everyone. Good morning or afternoon, I'm not sure, but just afternoon, okay. Um, thank you very much for, um, for having me and for organizing this and to my fellow panelists, I've learned a lot so far this morning. Um, so I have to switch modes now and get into um, presentation mode and not sit back and relax and listen. Um, so I have some slides. Is it possible to get those up? Oh, okay. Got it. All right. Um, so I'm just going to, to, just to give you some context um, for the remarks that follow, I'll just briefly tell you about the work that we do at um, Women for Women. Uh, that's the nickname we generally use. And I've restricted myself to a single slide, which is not easy to me, um, but um, I'll just sort of give a sample of projects under um, probably each of our programs, but would invite you to, to learn more because I won't be able to cover everything that we do. But um, we have these seven programs. Um, we've been around for um, about 28 years and 25 years formally. We, we had our 25th anniversary last year of when we were, were first registered as an organization in Canada. Um, and we work in Afghanistan and we also work in regions that serve um, or where Afghan nationals are living, um, like Pakistan and Turkey and Tajikistan. Um, so our Tech for Ed program has become really, really important with the ban on girls and women's education in Afghanistan because it presented an alternative way that girls could continue learning um, when they couldn't go to public institutions for school. Um, so under the Tech for Ed program, we have um, something called uh, DD Academy. So DD is for Darakte Danesh, which means knowledge tree in, in Dari or Farsi, one of the languages of Afghanistan. And in this academy, we have kind of three branches of this tree. So one branch is DD Library or Directed Anesh Library. And that is our, our oldest branch. Um, it's been around for 10 years. And it's a uh, online library of learning materials for Afghans. So in their languages, it works in nine languages on um, many, many, many different subjects. Um, and it's very, very well used. So all of the materials are, are free. Um, people access them online. We also have offline versions of the library um, in physical sites in Afghanistan. Um, and we get anywhere from 35,000 to 100,000 uh, visits a month um, from people using the materials. And so they, they use the materials independently for their own learning. There's everything from books and, and videos, uh, storybooks for children, uh, reading material, um, and the content's really directed by what our users want. So that's the first branch. The second branch is called DD Courses. And if you are familiar with um, EDX or Coursera, it's uh, sort of like a very tiny version of that kind of um, open course platform 
but customized for Afghanistan. So our courses are in Afghan languages and um, they're on subjects that our, our users are interested in. So people can take uh, full courses um, online um, at their own pace. They're, they're MOOCs or um, massive open online courses. And finally, the third branch of the tree is the youngest, uh, which is DD Classroom. And that's an online high school for girls. Um, so girls in grade seven to 12. And um, we established that when the Taliban closed schools for girls. So it opened in 2022. So we had our first pilot year with our, our first classes, just grade sevens. Um, and then we um, were able to have them go through a full school year um, and then add grade eights. Our grade nine started last month um, and our grade 10 started in a couple months. And the plan is that we'll keep building up to um, uh, offer up to grade 12. And we're very, very excited um, about a partnership with a school in Canada that's going to allow our students in Afghanistan to graduate with a Canadian high school diploma when they do complete grade 12. Um, so that's a little bit about what we do in Tech for Ed. Um, and I'll just jump to grants and scholarships um, because it's, it's related. People always ask us about access to the internet and hardware and they say, you know, oh, it's great you're doing this stuff online, but how do people actually access it? Um, so we try to address the access issue through one of our uh, grant programs, which is called Remote Communications Assistance. It's kind of a terrible name. It's very um, dull, but we came up with it in a hurry because we were responding to the crisis situation in Afghanistan. Um, and, and one of the issues was that people were struggling um, to be able to pay for internet access or to buy a computer or a smartphone um, or often um, to get electricity at home. So they needed a power bank to get around uh, power outages. Um, so we established this fund where students could apply and tell us, you know, they were in some kind of educational program, but they needed a device or they needed three or four months of, um, of data to be able to take their program. Um, so it, it quickly became a very popular program and um, we receive applications every single day. Um, and and process hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of um, uh, computers and internet and power banks for uh, girls and women in Afghanistan. Um, we also have a scholarship program to help women and girls access uh, mostly higher education, um, mostly online, but sometimes uh, in person in other countries, um, and a little bit of uh, basic education as well. Um, and then here in Canada, we do a lot of public engagement and advocacy um, focused on the human rights situation in Afghanistan and advocating for the restoration of the right to education uh, for everyone in Afghanistan. Um, so, yeah, so that will give you a snapshot of uh, the work that we do. Um, it's education focused, as you can tell, um, which is you know not obvious from our organizational name, but what we learned over the years was the shortest path to the empowerment of women and girls is with education. And that's a lesson we learned from women and girls in Afghanistan who told us, you know, we understand this human rights thing, but how can we actually realize our rights without literacy and without education? Uh, so that became the focus of our programming on the ground. Um, and to give you just one example of how we adapted programming in response to the crisis that came about in August, 2021, um, when the Taliban retook power in Afghanistan. Um, so this is a, a, an initiative we have called Learning Baskets, or it was called Learning Baskets, where we would deliver um, a basket of learning materials directly to homes. And we tried to have a mix of material for different ages, different interests. Um, there were storybooks, there were educational activities, um, things that could um, keep kids and, and youth and other family members busy. We actually started doing this during COVID um, when schools were closed um, and Afghanistan didn't have the kind of um, infrastructure to do home-based learning um, that other countries did. And, and so giving these materials to them to use in their homes was, uh, was necessary. So after August, 2021, um, an economic crisis uh, started as well. And I'll, I'll come to that in a minute, but it meant that a lot of families were focused first and foremost on survival. They were trying to get food on the table and that became really, really hard. And it's hard to think about studying and education um, when you're hungry and you're worried about how you're gonna feed your children. So we are not a humanitarian assistance organization. Um, 
and yet we also couldn't ignore that this was the reality of uh, the participants of our programs. So what we did was we combined the learning baskets with emergency food aid, um, and depending on the season, also other supplies that people might need, um, like blankets to get through the winter or, or fuel. Um, so we just started calling the baskets learning plus baskets um, to indicate that it was learning materials plus other things as well. Um, and it really helped it, it helped our students just, um, uh, you know, not have to worry about their day to day needs as much and, and get back to focusing on their education. So just one example of, um, uh, of how you see development programming adapting to crisis in different ways and how you have to kind of think on your feet and uh, do needs assessments and, and listen to your participants and find out um, how to stay relevant to their needs in times of crisis. Okay, so to give you, um, it, it's it's hard to give a, a snapshot of the very dynamic situation in Afghanistan, but um, I'm gonna just limit myself to briefly discussing these four very much overlapping crises that continue to unfold in the country. Um, so there's a human rights crisis. Uh, there's a crisis around denying women and girls access to education past grade six. Um, and the politicization of the public school curriculum at all levels, which impacts actually both uh, boys and girls and, and men and women. Um, there's a devastating humanitarian crisis that is worsening human development indicators um, that were on an upwards trend over the last 20 years and are, are reversing now. And then there's an exodus of people fleeing um, Afghanistan because of, of these crises. Um, and often you'll find that these crises are spoken of separately um, as if they're kind of unrelated to each other. Uh, but the focus of my remarks is, is really on how they are in fact really inseparable. So to begin with the human rights crisis, um, when the Taliban took power in August, 2021, uh, they very quickly announced an amnesty. So they said, we are not going to kill or harm or arrest uh, our traditional enemies, so people who collaborated with the previous regime, people who worked with NATO, um, human rights defenders, journalists, dissidents, people who criticized us. And almost as soon as the words were out of their mouth, they started doing exactly that, carrying out extrajudicial executions, uh, disappearing people, um, and that continues to this day. It's very well documented, in particular by Human Rights Watch, um, and um, that continues to happen. Yesterday, I read about um, a magazine editor and poet who um, has been arrested um, by, by the Taliban. Um, so it's, uh, it's, it's very dangerous for anyone seen as not supportive of the regime. Um, they also prioritized bringing back the so-called moral behavior rules that they were infamous for during the 1990s. Um, so the dress codes for women, They've also carried out arrests of women that um, they see as not complying with the dress codes um, or um, you know, women who uh, travel outside the city without a male chaperone um, and um, these kinds of behaviors. So they, they brought back again these um, uh, the, the police um, that try to enforce virtue, they call it, uh, and prevent vice. Um, they've really gutted the independent media sector in Afghanistan, um, which was thriving uh, from the, the growth of it experienced over the past 20 years. Um, remarkably, throughout the past um, uh, three years now that they've been in power, protests have continued fairly regularly, um, both women and, and men. Um, but those protests are often violently repressed. Protesters are arrested, they're, they're threatened, they're beaten on the streets. Um, so they've um, not allowed that uh, freedom of association and freedom of expression. Uh, the operational environment for civil society, both Afghan NGOs and uh, foreign NGOs operating there has become really, really difficult. There's a lot of interference in aid operations, um, you know, attempts to divert aid to um, the beneficiaries that the Taliban uh, choose. And... Um, uh, house raids as as a means of investigating people. These are quite terrifying experiences where they come to your house and um, violently search it to find out if you have any affiliations with the resistance movement or the previous government or the um, uh, military under the previous government. There, there's a lot more, but that kind of gives you an idea of um, how the situation has deteriorated 
uh, in the time that the Taliban has been in power. And a focus for us is, of course, the um, the education crisis, which is uh, intersects with the human rights crisis because it's um, a denial of the the right to education for women and girls. So, um, literally weeks after taking power, the Taliban um, banned girls from going to public school past grade six, and then in December 2022, they announced that um, women could no longer be in higher education. Um, so no matter where they were in their degree, uh, they were stopped right there. Um, and this is, you know, this policy is unique in the world. They're the only country in the world to restrict uh, girls and women's education in this way. And um, it's absolutely horrendous from a human rights perspective, but it's also horrendous from a, a development perspective. It's uh, It will do the country no favors as uh, it tries to um, advance and, and generate wealth that will really sabotage these efforts. Also part of the human rights crisis is the changes that the Taliban are bringing to the public school curriculum. Um, and um, uh, this is basically an, an overhaul of the curriculum to um, not focus on subjects like science and the humanities and languages um, and um, a big investment in replacing public schools with madrasas. Um, I won't go too far into this, but um, it's an ongoing concern that it affects both boys' education and girls. Um, and I'm happy to share further resources afterwards um, if people want to know more about that. So coming to the humanitarian crisis, um, it's it's hard to describe the the scale and severity of the situation. The overwhelming majority of the population is is food insecure. Um, and you know what that actually looks like, that's a kind of euphemistic way of saying lots of people are starving. Um, and this will have really, really long-term impacts, even for those who survive the, the malnutrition. Um, and this is affecting people you know, who were recently in the middle class or the upper middle classes in the country, they've been plunged into, into poverty. Um, and um, and in, you have all these stemming crises like the, the brain drain and then people turning to criminality uh, for livelihood because they're unable to find uh, legitimate livelihoods. Okay, and then the refugee crisis. Um, so the Taliban um, taking power, the targeting of, of dissidents and, and people who were affiliated to the previous regime and the economic impact of this triggered a new wave of people fleeing the country. Um, the evacuation from Kabul airport back in 2021 was well covered by the international media, but um, less well covered is the fact that hundreds of thousands of people have continued to leave since. Um, and these are de facto refugees by definition. They're people fleeing in fear of their lives. Um, and yet the refugee system has failed them. Um, Afghans find almost all doors closed to them, including those of their neighboring countries, um, which they have to pass through to go to any other countries. Um, and meanwhile, those who do manage somehow against great odds to leave um, often find themselves struggling to access education or education for their children. Um, for instance, undocumented migrants in Turkey can't register their children uh, in local schools. Um, many UNHCR refugee camps in Pakistan have no schools for girls past grade six. But imagine if refugees were seen as assets rather than burdens and supported to access education at all levels, including higher education. Then they become people who will rebuild their countries in the future and who contribute to the economies and societies of their new home countries too. Uh, look at William, um, who we heard from earlier. So this crisis that spouts from the humanitarian crisis really needs a complete reimagining. Um, refugees should be seen as part of the solution uh, rather than part of the problem. Um, you know, there are those who advocate for prioritizing Afghanistan's humanitarian needs over its human rights um, challenges. Uh, people will say, leave politics out of it, you know, just get help to the people who need it, look past this distasteful regime. Um, so that's how the argument goes. But these are not separate crises. These are one and the same. The cause of the humanitarian crisis is political and so must be its solution. And just one example of how intertwined human rights and humanitarian challenges are is the series of earthquakes that happened in Western Afghanistan um, last year. So over 90% of those killed in those earthquakes were women and girls. Why? Because they were home. 
they were not at jobs because they're not allowed to work. They were not at school because they're not allowed to study. Many of their husbands were away in Iran trying to earn money to send home because the economic situation was so bad. Um, so they were inside those households that um, collapsed on them. Um, and, and so you can see the clear uh, intersection here of um, the human rights crisis and humanitarian crisis. So the severe and too often deadly impacts of Afghanistan's collapsing economy and the soaring hunger and malnutrition are not the result of natural disasters um, of drought, for example. They are man-made disasters. Soon after the ban on women's work was announced, uh, by September 2022, the UN was warning that, quote, limitations on women's economic participation will likely have a long-term impact on household well-being and the economy. Um, the UNDP pointed out that women account for 20% of the country's workforce and preventing them from working could shave a half billion dollars alone from household consumption. And that's exactly what happened. The GDP shrunk, unemployment skyrocketed, and the overwhelming majority of the population, including the middle classes, fell below the poverty line. So this is a tragedy unfolding in slow motion. The Taliban leadership are perfectly aware that 20 years of economic progress has unraveled, that emaciated children are being brought into hospitals every day, um, that when they you know, shut down all the beauty salons in the country, that 60,000 jobs were lost uh, that had been enabled by women's economic um, entrepreneurship, and that families are making heartbreaking decisions, sending children to work on the streets, selling children out of desperate poverty. But to them, no price is too high to pay to return to the dystopian and inhuman tyranny that they subjected Afghans to when they first ruled Afghanistan, where the subjugation of women and girls is absolutely central to their governance, not peripheral to it, but the very basis of it. That's why the term gender apartheid is the right term to describe the situation, one where the entire system is based on gender inequality and discrimination. And that's why the humanitarian crisis is caused by the human rights crisis. So what do we do? Um, firstly, we recognize this causal relationship between human rights and humanitarian needs. Uh, when people's rights and freedoms are protected, they have greater agency and autonomy to meet their needs. They are more resilient and more empowered to face challenges. Even problems that look purely humanitarian on the surface are political when you scratch that surface. Amartya Sen famously pointed out that famines don't occur in democracies. So we need to make sure that our analytical lens sees the full picture and connects the dots between human rights and humanitarian issues, and that policy reflects this. Imagine if the United States and its allies had fully accounted for the consequences of their decision to negotiate with and empower the Taliban beginning in 2020 and could see into the future the enormous suffering that it would unleash over everyone, not just women and girls. If they could have accounted for the full costs of their policy decisions, would they have made different choices? And lastly, the way the international system thinks of and responds to the reality of millions of people fleeing bad situations, situations you can be sure that you would flee to, must change. The refugee system designed in the aftermath of World War II is not working for the refugees of today. More immediately, we can do more to make sure that displaced people get access to opportunities, to education, to training, to the dignity of a job, and that they get some of the power back that was taken from them, and they regain the freedom to decide their own future. Uh, the good news is that there's incredible work already happening um, that you can learn more about and support. I told you a little bit about what we do um, with Afghanistan, but I also wanted to um, just share this list of organizations that I, I think are doing great work, like um, INI, which um, makes the case that education is for emergencies. It is It should be part of the humanitarian package and not an afterthought for later after the emergency, that you have to continue education um, because we know that the longer the gap in one's education, the less likely people are to ever go back to school. So regardless of whether it's a natural, uh, natural disaster um, or war or another crisis, making sure schools are up and running in a crisis, in an emergency is really, really crucial. Um, the, the CLCC Consortium is a, a network of different organizations that are 
um, working to try to restore access to education during crisis. Um, there's maybe 30, 30 or 40 organizations in that consortium. The REACH project at Harvard um, does research on refugee education, what works and what doesn't. They have really fabulous resources on their website. Um, and um, the Global Task Force on Third Country Education Pathways tries to address credentials. Like for Afghanistan, if you're a girl and you live there, you cannot get a high school diploma issued by the Ministry of Education in Afghanistan um, on account of your gender. And so people in such situations need alternatives. They need somewhere to get a credential from. Um, the Alliance for Women's Education in Afghanistan is another network of organizations trying to work together. We're part of that um, to um, just leverage each other's successes and uh, coordinate and, and collaborate. Uh, World University Service of Canada um, established amazing organization um, uh, here, here in Canada, WUSC, that does fabulous work um, uh, helping refugees gain access to higher education um, by having them come and study in Canada. And finally, a younger organization called International Students Overcoming War, um, which I believe is based out of Laurier University and works a little bit with WUSC. Um, they do great um, direct service provision work and advocacy as well. Um, and I won't talk about this because I think I'm out of time, but we have a toolkit on our website about what Canadian universities and colleges can do to um, uh, help uh, Afghan women who are denied the right to higher education. There's um, several practical things that institutions can do from here that they can do right away. Um, so I invite you to uh, download the toolkit from our website and I'll just leave this up so you can get the link down. And thank you very much um, for listening. And um, yeah, for um, yeah, being being interested in in these issues. Thank you so much, Lauren, um, and thank you to all of our speakers today. We are going to be transitioning to the um, Q and A portion for the event, um, and I would just like to ask if Asiya and Lauren can come up to the table, and we're just going to probably angle the camera that direction. And if we could get the Zoom, um, our speakers, our panelists on Zoom, also um, up on the screen. Good. Uh, yep, yeah, and we can also see. And so we've actually got, and I knew we were going to have a fairly short Q&A portion, and I'm sure we all have so many um, questions. Um, I wish we did have more time. Um, what I would like to just draw our attention to the fact that we've got um, a group of students um, in the audience that are taking the GDS Anthropology 330 course on humanitarianism um, in the audience. And these students have come up, well, they've come up with a huge list of really, really important questions. And so I've picked out a few of their questions um, that we're gonna start with. And hopefully we might have time for maybe one or two questions um, from the audience um, after that. Um, perfect. Okay. So I wanted to actually start, and, and the questions that I'm posing from our students, and again, I could just pick a few of them, um, really are for anyone and all, if, if, if all panelists um, are able to um, answer for a minute or two, that would be wonderful. And I wanted to start off with a personal question um, that a few students had, which is what drew you to your work in the humanitarian or development sector? And what has given you the biggest satisfaction in the work that you've been doing? Um, so I know we've got two on Zoom and we've got two in person. So uh, Ginwan Mohammed, if you would like to, you can unmute. Um, we'll try to make sure that we can go around to all the panelists. Yeah, go ahead, Kinoa. Sure, um, thanks for the question. What drove me to development personally, I do believe that it is through um, education, it is through empowering um, children and specific, uh, it is at that age where we can really work on um, empowering those young children to become agents of change in their communities, to gain the um, technical, uh, um, uh, and life skills that they need to uh, grow up and uh, uh, do that change. I do believe in community-based change, that change has to happen from within. We need to empower um, communities uh, to do that uh, uh, that difference uh, from their, uh, from inside to do uh, initiatives, interventions at, at their community level. Um, and I, I do believe that that is the way really 
um, communities are able to develop and change. Um, so this is why basically uh, I uh, work in development uh, and why I to play in specific, because I do believe as well in the power of play to be that uh, approach that would um, uh, get children to gain all those uh, skills and uh, all that empowerment. It is through play, it is a fun approach. They have to have fun, they have to enjoy what they're doing and what they're learning to be able to accept and to get all that. Lauren or Essia or Mohammed, feel free. Um, okay, so my uh, uh, my, my my story is a bit personal. So it's uh, uh, I mean I'm I'm part of this community who has suffered, who has been through uh, you know uh, uh, affected uh, this uh, this affect that has been affected so much by this by this crisis that happened, and uh, I think uh, everyone wanted big to be this uh, you know uh, hero that will save and help the people in the in the future. So. Uh, I started very young. I was like 19 when I started working at Humanitarian. I was uh, volunteering for a local NGO in two areas in my city that had uh, clashes over seven years in Tripoli, Lebanon. And uh, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, afterwards I got, I was uh, working. I was getting paid for 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 my volunteering. Then I were started growing up in the organization, and I felt good. I felt good serving and what I what I was doing. And then at some point I felt like, uh, because I was working with adults almost, like uh, it was a rehabilitation program, mostly in these areas after the war. So afterwards uh, I, I saw like uh, the effect mostly should be, uh, would be m more major and bigger on children. So right to play was a very nice and comfortable place to be, be at and you know, uh, it, uh, where you can innovate and create, you know, new uh, creative ways of uh, uh, you know uh, teaching the building curriculums uh, even like now in our data collections we are becoming more playful and making it an enjoyable space so I think like and yeah basically that's it so this is uh, that's it thank you Um, I mean, it's a it's a mix of factors. It's not it's not one reason or, or one moment in time for me. Um, I became aware from a very young age, um, largely initially through exposure from through my family um, about the concept of injustice, um, as well as politics, and um, was raised in a family where, in my teens, we would speak about this. And then certainly in, in university, um, that became more clear. And I involved myself in a number of different associations and, and clubs. And immediately upon graduation from university, which what I, I would encourage all of you to look into if you're interested in this topic, um, I participated in three different internships, paid, uh, one with Right to Play, setting up their um, first um, project in Jerusalem. Um, with Morocco through the Government of Canada internship programs and uh, in the Philippines. And these were really excellent opportunities to see what was interesting, what was being done well, and in some of the cases where I worked, what was not being done so well. Um, what crystallized it for me was working with the International Committee of the Red Cross, another um, extraordinary organization that I would encourage you to research. Um, there I worked um, in detention, so with um, prisoners and detainees of war and prisoners of conscience in Afghanistan, uh, in Uzbekistan, and in, in Uganda. And that's where it became very, very clear to me um, that I was interested in the humanitarian assistance um, side of things um, as opposed to quote unquote uh, development. Thanks. Um, so how I started, um, I'll give you the specifics. It was um, 1996, I was in grade nine. That was when the Taliban took power in Kabul. I couldn't find Afghanistan on a map, um, but I read about what was happening there and I just could not accept that um, someone couldn't go to school on account of being a girl. And um, so I think being um, a child at that time had a lot to do with it. Uh, I don't know that the same would have happened if you know it was 10 years later. 
Um, but children, I think, have a really acute sense of injustice and um, they aren't kind of, they haven't been exposed to these arguments of cultural relativism and, and so on that adults in my life would later bring to me. Um, they just, you know, call a spade a spade. And I thought this is wrong. Um, and it doesn't matter if it's here or there, but it's wrong. So um, yeah, I, luckily I didn't know any better to um, sit still and not respond. Um, I certainly couldn't imagine where it would take me. It wasn't, there wasn't really a, a grandmaster plan, um, but I just followed that um, feeling of anger actually. Um, I think anger gets a bad rap a lot of the time, but it's really important fuel for good activism. Um, and then one of the things that keeps me going, uh, there's, there's so many, um, you know, we see little wins every day that I think help us get through the, um, you know, really discouraging situation in the country right now. Um, and, you know, the, I think the greatest, most valuable experience of my life has been um, witnessing people learning to read and write um, and the power that comes with it when they recognize that I did, I did this. I can do anything. Um, and it's easy for kids to become literate. It's very, very hard for adults. And we had a literacy program for women who didn't get to go to school under the previous Taliban regime. So they were age 15 and above. And it's a, it's a real slog to start from scratch and learn reading and writing at that age. Um, and once they conquered it, something just snapped in them that they thought, okay, bring it on. Um, I can do anything. Um, so to, to, to see that empowerment and what it looks like um, has been the greatest privilege of my life and something I wouldn't give up for anything. Thank you so much. Um, I have another uh, question that's come um, from our students as well, which is that in our course, we've been learning um, about how humanitarian and development aid actors and the sector as a whole has been evolving. And in particular, how um, they are beginning to center much more uh, local knowledge, voices, and perspectives. So the question is, how do you and your organizations um, attempt to involve local people and amplify local voices? Um, has this been challenging to do? And what have some of the benefits been? So anyone who, who would like to start can. I can start while people are gathering their thoughts. Um, so one way we do this is um, we, we we integrate our organization. Um, we have lots of Afghans working with us. And after the fall of Kabul, um, we prioritize the hiring of Afghans, um, which is often remotely as well, um, in, in part to respond to the economic situation. But um, yeah, making sure that, um, you know, people who are who have personally experienced these issues, who have direct knowledge of them, are at every level of the organization, from the board to the leadership, um, to you know, running the programs on the ground. Um, uh, I think it makes the programs um, effective and just having the habit of listening and what doing what I sometimes call slow development, like you know, slow food, the slow food movement, so slow development, where you just take your time to build programs and give yourself the luxury of time to have trial and error um, and you know, pilot things so it's a little bit low risk at first, see, see if things work, um, if you're not getting results, if you get you know, negative feedback to, to go out and try again and keep doing those iterations. Um, and I think, yeah, having more of a culture of um, um, the mistakes being okay and trial and error, um, I think is, is important and something I hope will expand more in the sector. Okay, I can go next. Um, I think sometimes we do underestimate the power of people, especially those in vulnerable um, in vulnerable areas or having um, uh, or uh, under uh, underprivileged. So we underestimate uh, the power of what they can do, um, whether they were adults or children. Um, and I think the trick here is really to trust that they can do and they are able. However, they just need the tools. They just need the right training from us as organizations. 
Um, we have some really good success stories uh, and what we do in Lebanon, because again, as I mentioned earlier, we work through those communities. We work through local actors. Um, for instance, uh, with any of our projects, we do not intervene directly. We train teachers or we train coaches from the communities themselves. Um, we give them a set of skills needed. We give them what they need to uh, go and train uh, uh, children in their communities. We've seen in many projects that after we left, the snowball has been growing. They are still working with the children. They are still uh, working on the, uh, um, on uh, um, you know, being the agents of change. We always repeat the sentence, but they become the agents of change from the, within the communities, and they were able to do it. We have some really great examples of uh, children who were participants in our projects, who were the direct beneficiaries for our projects and how later, uh, for instance, in the music project, after four years uh, um, being participants in our projects, um, they reached a, a stage where uh, we got to train them and now they are coaching other children. So uh, really change can happen from, um, from within. Um, and this has actually uh, encouraged us to start more what is called participatory, uh, uh, participatory programming to um, have uh, uh, beneficiaries and children participate from the planning phase, participate in the implementing phase, um, have uh, a strong voice in um, choosing uh, and, and, and discussing uh, uh, with us on how the project can go and should go. Um, and eventually we reached a stage where we are now piloting uh, assessments even when we are assessing the project, how to involve them in um, thinking of the evaluation methodology that we want to use into creating the tools together. Um, this, this empowers them on so many levels. It not only helps us understand the context better, especially in areas where um, the staff wouldn't be like living in, um, but it, it really surprises us when we get to see how after we leave, they are still leading on their own, um, you know, small local community initiatives and they are just, uh, continue, continuing the work. So we, we, I think, really have to trust that process and put more effort into um, into um, empowering uh, those uh, people in vulnerable areas um, rather than us doing the work and us always like presenting aid and providing aid. Just give them the right tools and they will be able to do it and much better than we can do because they are from, this, uh, from these uh, places. a question you might want to address or I might have one final question that you might be interested in answering as well. Um, as a final question, I know we are at time, but um, I just, if, if anyone would like to answer, and I have a feeling Asiya might um, give us a good response to this one. We've been learning a lot about the humanitarian principle of neutrality, and we wanted to find out your thoughts about the need to be neutral as a humanitarian actor. Is this possible? Should this always be the case? Um, and how can you carry out important work that you need to do without being stopped or prevented by government or other actors in the countries in which um, you have been working? Great question. Thank you very much. Um, I'll just jot down a couple of notes and then address. Okay, um, I'd like to offer you a couple of concrete, or one at least concrete example um, with the International Committee of the Red Cross. So these principles of um, um, humanitarian action, which were out, which I outlined earlier, neutrality being one of them. So humanity first, always first, impartiality. So the distinction, ensuring that everyone who needs aid gets it. Neutrality, not taking sides and independence. They all work in concert. So to look only at neutrality um, is difficult, but I take your point. And um, here looking at the work of the International Committee of the Red Cross. So today I spoke about public advocacy, strictly about public advocacy. Not all organizations and some of the most um, powerful um, and wide reaching organizations choose not primarily to advocate publicly. And this includes the International Committee of the Red Cross. So this is the organization based out of Geneva, a part of the Red Cross movement um, in concert with the, the Federation of the Red Cross. So the ICRC works primarily in conflict uh, zones, whereas the Federation works primarily in relation to natural disasters. So working in conflict, I worked, um, when working in Afghanistan, I worked in Bagram prison. 
um, which as some of you may know, was run by the um, coalition uh, led by the United States many years ago. When I was there, it was just for a few months um, in 2011, I believe. And um, we went once for a two week stay on the air base. It was a US air base. Um, and during that time, uh, our, our role there, we were there for, as I mentioned earlier, detention visits, was to interview um, prisoners of war. In most cases, it was members of the Taliban to ensure that according uh, that, that their treatment was in accordance with international humanitarian law, which as our, um, uh, Mattia mentioned earlier, is how wars are run there. There are still rules. And during that time, um, to cut a long story short, we found many, 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 I mean, thousands of, um, not in that one visit, but the ICRC found instances of uh, torture, of ill treatment in, in multiple graphic forms, which I won't go into. At that time, the ill treatment in Bagram prison was not well documented. And the ICRC was one of very, very few, and I would say on one hand, um, and certainly had the most wide reaching, reaching access. Um, that's not just the case with Bagram um, prison, but if you know today in Gaza, which is the organization that is in charge of meeting with the hostages held by Hamas. It's the International Committee of the Red Cross. And why is this? It is because they hold the principle of neutrality and not taking sides, not speaking out in favor of one side or another, but doing really, I would say, 90% of their advocacy and diplomacy behind closed doors that governments, states, non-state armed groups, such as the Taliban, will allow them access to prisons that are normally hidden from view, hidden from Doctors Without Borders, hidden from um, other United, or not other, but United Nations organizations. Without this principle of neutrality, it would be impossible to gain that access. So yes, it's, it, it's imperative along with the three other humanitarian principles. Um, is it always possible in perfection? Absolutely not. Do we get it wrong many, many times? Yes, but should we continue to strive for that? Um, Absolutely. Just as one note, neutrality does not mean necessarily, I think this is really important in, in current conflicts, past conflicts, and it's very, it's very much exemplified in Gaza and why I chose to speak about that today, is that not taking sides in, when working in the humanitarian sphere is very different than not being clear about facts on the ground when we are undertaking advocacy. Thank you. So much. And although I would love to have another round of questions for all of our panelists, I would really like to thank everybody, um, uh, the speakers in particular, for sharing um, their views and, and um, experiences with us today. Thank you um, to everyone who helped to organize. Thank you to the audience. Um, I'm just going to put up on the screen as we um, close out this event um, a final slide um, that has a QR code on it. Um, if all of those attending on Zoom, I think we've already sent it out to the Zoom participants, but those in the audience um, here with us today um, can please fill out a post-event survey. Um, that would be wonderful. Um, have a safe journey home. Please stop at the back and see if and grab some more snacks and drinks um, on your way out. And thank you so much, everybody, for coming today. And thank you all to our speakers. Thank you. Thank you.